Okay. Move out. the world, the United States Army is fulfilling a variety of missions in the service of our country. Some of these missions and the things which happen while our soldiers are carrying them out make interesting stories. The events which we will report on today are quite the usual for your army, but most of our stories are generally unknown to each of you. The items on display here are indicative of the fascinating things we will show you during the next 30 minutes. Join us, won't you, as your Army reports. You know, in the old days, they used to call a telescope a looking glass. The Army still uses them today. Take, for example, Korea. Our Army advisors are still there, working side by side with the troops of the Republic of Korea. And their job is to maintain constant surveillance of the demilitarized zone. And this is one of the tools used by the men who guard the frontier. This is Guard Post 107 on the perimeter of the western sector of the demilitarized zone. It overlooks the vast Chorwon Valley and the mountains of North Korea beyond. In 1950, there was bitter fighting here involving troops of the U.S. 3rd Infantry Division. Today, a detachment of troops from the Republic of Korea Army operate this DMZ guard post with the assistance of key personnel from the U.S. Army Advisory Group, Korea. South Korean civilians from the town of Wee jung Bu some 12 kilometers away, come here for medical treatment at the American Army Dispensary. The medical aid station is part of the operation of the U.S. advisory contingent. Korean personnel assist the members of the medical team and act as interpreters. Essentially, the U.S. Army doctor and medics are here to take care of the Korean troops, but they also carry out this civic action service. Through the Korean soldiers, the doctor and his enlisted medics are able to question patients regarding their ailments. The little girl being examined here is suffering from a carbuncle on her back, and the doctor is questioning the mother regarding the child's diet. One day each week is set aside for the treatment of these Korean civilians. On these regular sick call days, the Americans treat 50 to 60 patients. The emergency cases are handled anytime. Patients requiring major medical care cannot be hospitalized here due to lack of space and the priority requirements of the military. They are referred to one of the charity hospitals in the city of Seoul. Most of the cases, however, like this boy with a skin condition, are handled right here. The detachment of troops at this remote outpost are members of the tough, well-trained Wan Bang San Tigers, part of the Korean 6th Infantry Division. In a situation where duty is lonely and monotonous, but where each man must remain always alert. Athletic games are both stimulating and relaxing. A silent sentinel, this old tank is used as a gun emplacement. Nearby, its crew retrieves dry laundry as part of their regular ritual. 
Early each morning, a security patrol musters in the courtyard of this military outpost and march off for a police tour of the DMZ in this area. The timing of the other daily patrols is staggered to prevent their North Korean counterparts from learning the routine. If trouble were to come, it would most likely be under cover of darkness and down this valley floor. These patrols search for any signs of activity or the presence of enemy agents beyond the immediate range of observation. Thus far, life at K-Mag West remains undisturbed. To a soldier, his shoes and the way they fit him are of paramount importance. He is often on his feet 12 or more hours at a time. For those who may have special problems with their feet, the Defense Orthopedic Clinic makes custom-fitted orthopedic shoes like this. How these special shoes are made is the subject of this next report. At the Defense Orthopedic Footwear Clinic, Boston Army Base, Boston, Massachusetts, Army specialists use knowledge, ingenuity, and skill to help correct slight variations of nature which might otherwise handicap a soldier. Here, requests are received and processed from all parts of the world for special footwear which enable its wearer to continue his normal life and military duties. An orthopedic technician takes ball, waist, and instep measurements of a soldier's foot and marks the foot with an indelible pencil. These lines will later appear on a plaster cast, enabling the shoemaker to obtain the same measurements on the cast as taken on the foot. The foot is then placed in a mold box of magnetic balls and adjusted for any shortening or deformity by the levers on the casting machine. A protective metal hood is placed around the foot which holds the plaster of Paris being poured and properly filled to obtain an outer mold. When the technician removes the hood and plaster mold, he reassembles the mold and pours plaster into the mold opening to obtain an exact model of the man's foot. Then he adds whatever is necessary to the model, which in this case is a missing toe, shaping it to match the other foot as close as possible. Later, using an ingenious device, an exact metal mold of the foot is obtained, based upon the plaster of Paris model. The molding is checked for measurements and is then shipped to a civilian contractor who, in turn, produces a wooden last from the metal mold. These special lasts are returned to the clinic and technicians assemble the required corrective footwear. Dress shoes and jungle boots are shipped wherever required to provide the men with corrective orthopedic appliances. The Defense Orthopedic Footwear Clinic makes its contribution to the health and well-being of the American servicemen. The word is briefing. In military parlance, it means to explain any plan or mission to those who will be involved in its undertaking. In Vietnam, all battle operations are carefully planned in advance so the various elements of our Airmobile Army can coordinate their efforts. Each participating group, whether it be infantry, artillery, or helicopter crews, must be briefed. To do this, a tactical operations map, such as this one, is prepared to show the location of the objective, routes of approach, 
time elements, and all other pertinent information. Now, this particular briefing was given to the commander of an infantry company and to his platoon leaders one Wednesday morning last winter. In the hills around Dak Tho, in the central highlands of Vietnam, there is a key location overlooking the valley approaches to several strategic ridges. Now, from these ridges, the Viet Cong had been laying down mortar fire upon our ground forces, moving northward along the edge of the foothills. The objective was to seize this rather level plateau, create a fire base for our artillery here, and with the assistance of additional troops, which would later be airlifted in through the landing zone, fan out over the adjacent ridges and capture the enemy mortar positions. The attacking force was delivered by helicopter to this open area. Heavy wooded slopes prevented the helicopters from delivering the troops any closer to the objective. Now, meanwhile, as part of the uh, operation, the top of the objective hill was struck from the air. Bombing runs were made by the U.S. Air Force to clear any communist forces entrenched there. It all started at 0600 hours, which is 6 o'clock in the morning. And by 8.40, our men had worked their way up the slope of the hill and were nearing the crest. Combat motion picture cameraman went with them for this report. Nearly an hour has passed since these men of the 1st Air Cavalry landed at the base of Hill 815. It has been an hour of hard physical effort, climbing these vine and brush-covered slopes. Whether or not the enemy will be waiting for them at the top is not certain. As they near the summit, there is increasing evidence of the U.S. airstrikes made earlier. This is Objective Tango. The North Vietnamese Army forces which held this position have apparently withdrawn. From past experience, however, it is suspected the enemy has not gone far. The crown of a hill is a shambles, yawning bomb craters and shattered tree trunks poking upward with skeleton fingers. The welter of tree rubble will have to be cleaned up. guards are posted. Before the first wave of Helleborn troops can land here, the fire base needs to be cleared. It is a time-consuming process, and with no prepared positions, the men of this company are in haste to secure the hilltop. Enemy fire. Mortar shells coming out of nowhere. top of the adjoining ridge, and soon, the enemy barrage ceases. For some of the Americans, the attack has been costly. The wounded are given first aid and prepared for evacuation by medical helicopter. of the casualties is whisked away. The men doggedly return to their labors. Within a few hours, Hill 815 will be serving as a fire base for airborne artillery units. The valley below will be secure, and the corridor leading northward will be safe to travel once again. Missiles in our time are carrying men into orbit around the Earth. In doing this, Missiles such as this ICBM 
travel at speeds in excess of 12,000 miles per hour. Tracking these missiles in flight and plotting the exact position of the great rockets is a science requiring complex electronic equipment and a team of highly skilled technical experts. Mid-air interception of one missile by another demands the utmost of the men who control the intercepting vehicles such as the Spartan. Our next report shows how our early detection system worked and how defensive missiles would be brought to bear on attacking aircraft or missiles if the need arose. Modern aviation technology is producing aircraft that can fly increasingly faster and higher. This poses new and constantly changing problems in the air defense of our nation. Theirs or ours, hostile or friendly, are questions which must be answered quickly and accurately with no time for a second guess. To meet any threat to the United States from the air is the responsibility of NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command. NORAD headquarters at Colorado Springs includes personnel from the U.S. Army, Navy, and Air Force, and members of the Canadian Armed Forces. Together, they and the air defense units available to them form a powerful team for the protection of the North American continent. The U.S. Army element of NORAD is ARADCOM, the Army Air Defense Command. ARADCOM has operational control of the surface-to-air missiles which defend our key population and industrial centers against air attack. high-altitude Nike Hercules. And the Hawk for targets at a lower altitude. In order for these weapons to destroy their air targets, effective methods of detection, tracking, and engagement are essential. This system must meet the challenge of supersonic speeds and hostile air weaponry of growing destructive capability. In 1966, after two years of research, in cooperation with American industry, ARADCOM developed a dramatic new concept in air defense fire distribution systems, Missile Mentor. Smaller than the old Missile Master and costing considerably less in manpower and money to operate and maintain, Missile Mentor proved itself in test to be a faster and more reliable electronic fire coordinating system. It combined all the features of the Missile Master with the additional advantages of compactness, mobility, and a more versatile capability for integrating the operation of surface-to-air missile firing units. Solid-state circuitry allows the Missile Mentor system to be fitted into two military semi-trailer vans. An operations van for fire distribution command and control. And an equipment van which houses data processing apparatus. Tied in with appropriate radar units, including a long-range acquisition radar, the Missile Mentor forms a fire distribution system adaptable for a great variety of air defense situations. While the transportable Missile Mentor could function in a field environment, in many locations in the United States, the wheels have been removed from the vans and they are serving as permanent ARADCOM facilities. The data processing machines in the equipment van includes a general purpose computer which receives, stores and transmits air defense intelligence from NORAD and its various data collecting agencies. The computer assembly houses the memory units which are contained in plug-in printed card circuits. Into this data center are fed the vital statistics of approaching aircraft, height, range, speed, and azimuth. With this information, personnel in the operations van initiate action which will harmonize the battle actions of missile firing units 
within a single defense area. In an air defense emergency, the operations section of Missile Mentor has three major capabilities. Tracking the flying object which has entered radar range. Tactical control in ordering missile fire if identification should prove unfriendly. and monitoring each new development in the air situation. From his console, the fire direction control officer can observe the detailed progress of an air engagement. Console operators may flash various types of air intelligence symbology on their radar scopes, while one scope may be following the diminishing distance of several unidentified flying objects, Another may concentrate on controlling fire units and updating the symbology. The high-speed computers and the electronic display consoles of Missile Mentor give the commander more complete target data than he has ever had upon which to base his battle decisions. He is in continuous contact with his firing batteries by automatic data link and by voice. An electronic loop allows the commander to exchange information with personnel in the mentor van, at the battery site, or at higher command and control centers. In some areas, the range of missile mentor is extended by the addition of a remote radar integration station. This facility is housed in a van similar to the others and carries similar equipment. Its radar is specifically deployed to draw or net target data from distances beyond the range of the radars at the fire distribution site. By extending the radar horizon of the defense area, a remote radar tracking station located some distance from the missile mentor can permit missile batteries to begin target engagements even before the enemy aircraft comes within range of their own radars. The remote radar installation performs an important radar function in the Missile Mentor system. Missile Mentor, a dynamic concept in air defense fire distribution systems. Operated 24 hours a day by expertly trained men of the Army Air Defense Command, it meets the challenge of modern air weaponry, coordinating the battle actions of the surface to air missiles which protect American cities from enemy air attacks. Whenever the average citizen thinks of a soldier, he thinks of a uniform. He thinks of the traditional steel helmets worn in combat by the fighting man. What he doesn't know is that a bewildering array of headgear has made its appearance in our modern day army. Here's a report on the situation. The variety of hats being worn by our troops overseas is something to make your hair stand on end or be crushed flat, whichever the case may be. Men's fashions have come to Vietnam. Take these two fellows, for instance. They've gone functional. The blotchy coloration of this headgear and its shapeless shape confuses the enemy and thus saves the wearer from having a hole drilled in his noggin. Even in the military classroom, these soggy-looking numbers grace the heads of instructors and students alike. These are the original everything hats. They not only shade the eyes and protect the head, but when rolled up, make excellent fly swatters. Oh, what fun! The stylish navy blue cap with its reinforced eye shade and emblem of parachute and wings is here modeled by a couple of gentlemen who handle air cargo for a living. Despite rotor downdraft and other unique forms of abuse, these stout lands carry on looking as natty as ever.
A fireman is a fireman, no matter where you find him. And despite what you may think, Army firemen wear a fireman's hat. Not everyone gets to wear this symbolic helmet. First, you have to prove you are not a hothead. Then when the engine pulls out, you can be one of the boys. This is not the warm-up pen for the St. Louis Cardinals. This is Vietnam, and these are expert repairmen working on a helicopter engine. With this bunch, baseball has gone to their heads. If you can't understand why our boys in Vietnam have gone so hat crazy, take a look at this. They call it a tanker's helmet. How would you like to wear this little number to work? You need a can opener to get back out. Of course, this kind of hard hat has its charms. Besides having its own telephone, it keeps you from getting your brains beat out in the event of rough roads while driving this wide-track government vehicle. Everybody knows Vietnam is tropical and warm. So what did they do? They designed this chapeau to hug the head, then made it out of wool felt and a heavy leather headband. What fun it is when these boys take their hat off to you. Heavens to Betsy, it would never do for the Army aviators to go unnoticed. And with this bright blue head cover, who could miss them? Somehow, it doesn't seem fair. These fellows get to wear two hats. Hey, wait a minute. Haven't we seen that number somewhere else? Is nothing sacred? Identity through your style of hat is not a bad thing in itself, but the way this thing is going, it's turning into a hat war. Let me out of here. From Vietnam to Boston, from Colorado to Korea, we have brought you glimpses of your United States Army in action on Your Army Report.